Okay, so now for something completely different. <laughs> Normally, I talk about layer one issues. This time, I'm going to talk about a completely different subsystem. <laughs> so what am I talking about? Blinking lights. As you can see, RJ45 connectors. They often have a little LED in them that blinks. And it tells you if your networking's working or the cable's falling out of the back or whatever else. There's generally two different ways they're controlled. Either the Phi or it's the Mac. Or in this weird diagram here, both. But nobody ever does that. And they're all different. There's no standardization. If you look at 802.3, it doesn't say a word about LEDs or Phi's, or these controllers. What they can do, what they can't do, which means that every vendor does something different. No standardization whatsoever. When you look at the control bits, they all look different. Makes it a right mess. It also means that the old vendors try to do something different because this is where they can differentiate. They can make their lights blink different to everybody else. Long, long time ago, 2010, Marvel put in their first way of doing it in the device tree. Basically, select page three in the Phi, Register to 10, mask it with zero, and write 242 hex to it. Which, if you've got the data sheet, you can figure out what that means. I can't. I don't have the data sheet. Nowadays, the DT maintainer would run away screaming and say, no, you're not allowed to do that anymore. You're not allowed to write random values into random registers anywhere. But this was 2010, and we didn't know how to do anything better. Got slightly better 2018. At least then it had a name and it was just for LEDs. But it's still a collection of values which you wrote into a register. Or at least it was only the LED register and not anything else. So what's wrong with this? There's no consistency. You kind of expect the LED to say the same thing all the time. Or you expect some sort of consistency. It blinks. That means the packet's probably come and gone. It's lit. The link shows us a light. Shows you got link. So that even though there's no standardized consistency, the user experience should be consistent. So there shouldn't be any reason why every vendor needs to do it differently. Yeah, they do. It's also not really a thing that should be in device tree. Device tree is supposed to describe the hardware, not the configuration of the hardware. And the other thing is that we as users want to configure this, not necessarily the person who writes the device tree. So there's lots of discussions and lots of vendors still trying to do that weird way. And there's lots of discussions about this. And eventually, Florian came up with this, it kind of summarized it, what we thought. We should all try and do it the same way. We should define the subset of standard meanings. And this was the first time that somebody actually mentioned, why don't you use the LED subsystem of Linux? Because Linux knows how to blink LEDs already. Seemed really logical at the time. But the usual problem, nobody had any time to actually implement it. So people keep coming along with all their hacks, and we said knack, and we said knack, and we said knack again. And we keep knocking them. If those people had actually got together and spent their time implementing what they said, we'd have got something in much faster. But no, we send, keep sending knacks and they keep trying. So this is one of those lesson learned sort of things. Before you try and submit something, please search. Has it already been knacked? It's likely to get knacked yet again. And that comes up all over the stuff that I look at in the networking side. Things repeated, people repeatedly post the same thing and expect it not to get knacked. So, learn your history, otherwise you'll repeat it. The other thing is, there's a tendency to solve it for my driver and not solve it for everybody. And that's again something I tend to point out to people who are submitting code. This isn't a solution for your driver, this should be a solution for everybody. There's too much silo thinking at times. I work for vendor X, I only work on driver X. 
everybody else is somebody else's problem. And it shouldn't be like that. It's got a bit better. People are doing reviews outside of their own silo now, but it's still not so good. And you can learn a lot from looking at other drivers. The page pool is a good example of this. I'll solve it for everybody, not just for me. There's lots of, there's a few drivers that have got something like the page pool already. But then somebody came along and said, oh, well, let's make this generic and everybody can use it. That should be the default thinking. Please solve it generically. It's probably not specific to your hardware. And there's other things that people always get wrong. Sometimes I review lots and lots of code. Everybody gets pause wrong. Everybody gets energy efficient Ethernet wrong. Why? The API is bad to start with. It's poorly documented. And if you're finding in somebody else's code to copy, it's probably wrong there as well. The other thing that's going wrong here is that pause, you end up setting two bits on your hardware. But to get to those two bits, you've got to do quite a lot of understanding of the API. Why isn't that in the core? And then the core just says, set this bit here or set that bit there. And now with FileLink, we've done that. So FileLink drivers tend to get this right just magically because FileLink does all the real work and they just do set their two bits. Energy efficient Ethernet, there's a pack, set of patches around about which will throw away 80% of the code in the drivers, centralize it, hopefully most of these bugs will go away. So make the core do the work, not the drivers. Keep the drivers simple, which is not always simple because these drivers are huge at times and they do all sorts of silly things, but try and get as much of this stuff into the core as you can. This is where I see how many gray beers we've got. Who remembers Rusty Russell? Two, three. <laughs> this goes back a long, long way. 2008, I think. He set a, came up with a metric about how good APIs are. Then you can't get it wrong. Through to one, if you read the right mailing list, you might get it right. And there's various levels in between. Fortunately, our pause API probably fits to one and just nobody actually reads the mailing list. If you really want to cause people trouble, there's actually also minus one through to minus 10 and there you're trying to design APIs which nobody can use. It's a deliberate design decision to make them bad. It's worth reading. Read the whole set about from Rusty Russell. Hopefully then you'll produce better APIs and you won't mess up my life of trying to review this stuff. So, how do we get this right? I have, didn't can't take too much credit for this. Christian Marangi did most of the work. I just pointed in the right direction every so often, did the review work, and I actually did Marvel Fi. He did the Qualcomm stuff on the core. In networking, we've con, kind of got this rule for offloading. We start with what Linux can already do, and then we try and give it to the hardware to do. So what can Linux already do with LEDs? You go and look on your machine, or a machine, this class LEDs, you'll find a list of all the LEDs that's on the machine. And this is from my laptop. So things like the numlock key, the shift key, this little red button light, they're all controllable. I can turn them on and off and everything else. So within that directory, there's a brightness file. There's a few selections of files. I'll just quickly explain how you use them. Brightness, put zero there, and it goes out. Pretty logical. Put a one, it lights up. The backlight for the keyboard on this display has two different levels. So the max brightness value is two. So you could also put two into that brightness thing, and it will glow really bright. So you put one, and it dimly glows. That's for user space, but we're more talking about kernel space. The kernel can control these LEDs itself, and there's various triggers to do that. You allow it to say, oh, 
I've just done a write to the disk, make it go blink. There's a trigger for that. You want to show that you've turned the radio off for RF kill. There's a trigger for that. You can get the very subsystems to control the LED. And just a very simple example, heartbeat. The cat arc beat to the trigger, the thing will start blinking like a heart. And it monitors the CPU load. And as the CPU load goes up, it blinks faster. So if you've got, you ever want to know as your kernel crashed, set that up on your shift lock key or whatever else. And if it stops blinking, your machine's dead. <laughs> okay, so back to networking. <laughs> there was a NetDev trigger already. Didn't do everything we wanted, but it did most of it. So you select the NetDev trigger, and suddenly you get a few more files in there. Things like half duplex, link 100, TX, RX. If you give it the name of the interface, and you say one to RX and one to TX, you then start blinking on packet activity. And you can do that on any LED. So your numlock can show you the network activity if you want it. You could make your backlight of your display show you the network activity. It's an LED. This works for any LED. But ideally, you want it on your RJ45. Don't have to do, but you could do. So we needed to extend the API so that we can get the hardware to blink for us, not software. And this is extending with this class LEDs a little bit. First one's the standard interface. Set the brightness. If you've got that, you can do everything in software. If you want to actually offload it, then you need a few more, uh, uh, you need to implement a few more ops. First one is, can I even offload this co collection of things that the user wants to see? So you could say, can I offload RX and TX at the same time? And it will say, sorry, no, the op not op, can't do that. Because some, Spies weirdly can't show RX and TX at the same time on some LEDs. They're all different. It's a vendor differentiation. They screw it up in their own way. So once you've asked it, can it do this? And it says, yes, I can do this. Then you can actually ask it to do it. And that's what the next one does. And there's a reason there's two separate things there in, because it's quite expensive to swap from one to the next. And you don't really want to do it unless you know you're going to succeed. And then the last one is about what device am I actually blinking for? You don't want to try and offload blinking of network activity to ETH1 when it's actually being driven by ETH0. You've got to stay with software for that setup. So you need to know what am I connected to? What's my upstream device? And that's what the last calls for. If all this fails, you go back to just blinking in software, which is how we do things in networking. If you can't offload something to the bridge, a hardware bridge, you leave it in software and let it do it in software. Maybe less so if you're working at 100 gigabits per second, but if you're talking about little switches that I tend to work with, yeah, we just leave it in software. The bit that probably gives us a Rusty Russell score of seven or eight is this flags thing, and it's a bit not so nice. You've got to somehow describe what you want it to do. And you end up with just a bitmap. If you want it to show link, you set bit zero. If you want it to show it's got negotiated 10 megabit second link, you set bit one and so on and so on. Often, you know, in the little example here, you'll say, show me link on the left LED, show me activity, which is a combination of RF and TX on the right one. You're done. Questions? Because it's as simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> oh.
Okay, I'll start. Um, so you gave, an, gave us examples of APIs which are which people always get wrong. Can you think of something that people is like not trivial, but usually driver authors get right? <laughs> Sending packets, most lab. <laughs> <laughs> Receiving packets. <laughs> um, actually, that's a bit I generally don't look at because that's something they always test. Yeah. <laughs> um, they generally normally get the name of the driver in the ETH tool information. They get all the, you know, the trivial stuff. Right. I think we document things like in three different ways, right? One way is to write documentation under documentation slash whatever. The other one is to put KDocs in the API. Yeah. And the third one is to have an implementation that you can point people at. And I wonder which one of those, I mean, do we have to do all three because then we have to keep them in sync, right? Like, is there, a, is one of them more important? I think having a good reference is useful. It's still the problem though, is getting people to realize there's a good reference and go and look at it. They just tend to look at some other driver and copy it. And often you pick the wrong driver to copy and you just copy all the bugs from that driver. So I tend to recommend for simple drivers, go look at the FEC. And for big drivers, I don't recommend anything because I don't review them. <laughs> Other questions? All right, thank you. <laughs>